This is your story. This is writing without structure. This is writing your story without structure. Any questions? Um, I know things in the world are crazy. And I just want to tell you, they're always crazy. They just have a different form right now. So step back, breathe, and just remember, you personally might be going through a hard time right now. The world might be going through a hard time right now. But you, you can do it. You can make it. It's okay. Take it one day at a time. And if that seems too hard, take it one minute at a time. You basically blew a lot of minutes watching this video. So, hey, you can definitely take it one minute at a time. Amen to that. And don't forget to get your vitamin D and smile. You know, look yourself in the mirror and, and just smile and be like, you know what? I am imperfect and that's okay with me. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my channel. I'm Ian Chaffin, author of a lot of books, sort of, and knower of things. And today we are doing another word stock episode where we and a lot of other awesome, cool writers and authors here on YouTube will be going over story structure. So if you don't know what story structure is, it's basically the structure of your entire story. Thanks, Liz. That helped. Eh. You're welcome. So basically, it's like the skeleton in a human or, you know, the foundation of a house. If you don't have a good one or you don't have one at all, your story will suck and suffer and be a blob on the floor. Kind of gross. How do we even move around? I do not know. So it is vital, very important for you to have a great structure in your story. Now, don't freak out. I know some people will be like, oh, if you don't have a great structure, it'll suck. You know, like me. Don't worry, all hope is not lost. You can still have a great story structure. Now, there are many, many types of structures you can use within a story. Some of the most popular ones are the three-act structure, the hero's journey, and one of the newest ones, the save the cat method. And I'm pretty sure my awesome writers and authors of Wordstuck will be talking about these. Oh yeah. But I'm going to turn this topic on its head and I will be talking about the most basic structure you have to have within your story. It's like the substructure. It, it's the basic plans, right? Like if you don't have plans for the house that you're going to build, you're not going to build the foundation right nor the rest of the house. You're going to spend all the money on the shiny new golden toilet and the cool gaming room with said toilet in it. If you don't have plans, how are you going to recreate the awesome T-Rex from Jurassic Park by using a little bit of its DNA? Or how will you create the mammoth again? Though in all honesty, why would you want to do that? Science, no. Life will find a way. It's fine. You don't have to get involved. Don't play God. Because that always worked out well. But I digress. The main point I want to get across to you in this video though, is that these points I'll be giving to you are the most basic. So whether you go with the hero's journey, the three-act structure, the save the cat method, or anything that the writing world will give you, these are the most basic concepts of each and every one of them. So if you haven't clicked off of this video because of my rants and all that, let's get into it. So the first basic part of any story, pretty much, is the protagonist. This is the entity that your readers will follow throughout the story. Now, does this entity have to be one single person? No, 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 it does not. It does not. The protagonist can be one person, a group of people. It can be an idea if you're, you know, going for more historical stuff in, in the non-fiction range and all that. It can be a lot of things or a lot of people, or one person, or anything like that. So yeah, it can be whoever or whatever you want it to be, as long as the audience will follow it. Bonus tip though, the audience does not have to follow them constantly in all that. The protagonists, if there's more than one, can split up and the audience will go with whoever you want them to go with. Uh, you can also have the antagonist in there, and his or her point of view. But in all honesty, if the antagonist has a point of view, they are the protagonist of some sort. But that is a whole different thing. We'll get into that later. Just 
It's a gray area. Mm. Speaking of the antagonist, that's number two. So, the antagonist is any entity that rivals the protagonist. Now, does this entity have to be one single person? No. Does this entity have to be a person at all? No. This entity could be nature. This entity could be the protagonist's inner self. This entity could be anything you want it to be because it's your story, darn it, and you will write it. Because I'm not going to write your story. I have all my other stories to write. So, d you know, don't ask. No. The antagonist is just anything or anyone that will go against the protagonist. The antagonist doesn't even have to be a living, breathing creature. It could be a storm. You know, it could be a snowstorm or a, a thunderstorm or a th other types of storms that are out there. Yes. As long as the protagonist will have to go up against this antagonist of sorts, that's, that's what makes it an antagonist. So, yeah. So next is three and four at the same time. It's the protagonist's goals and needs. Pro tip. And yes, there will be a lot of those in this video. The protagonist's goals and needs can be the same thing. Or not. It depends on you. You, the author. For example, the protagonist could be a hopeless student that just needs to pass this grade. And that's what they really need, to pass the grade. Because if they don't, oh no, they're gonna go to the, the, the bad school and stuff like that. I don't know, I'm just making these up as I go along. So the goal and need match. But what if the protagonist really, really wants? Their goal in life is to be number one. But their need is to not be a butthead all the time, and they need to learn how to respect their elders. So there, the goal and need are separate ways. If the goal and need are separate, you as the author will have to tell the protagonist, meaning you will have to have that story unfold where the protagonist has to choose between their want, no, their goal in life, what they set their mind on, and their real need, you know? Yeah, you can be number one in life, but if you have no friends, is it really worth it? Right? Right? And if you really want some very good examples of these, watch anime. And I'm not just saying that because I'm an anime fan and you should watch anime because it's freaking awesome. To go along with this is number five and six. Oh, yes. The antagonist's goal and need. What? The bad guy has a goal and need? Well, yes, and the antagonist doesn't have to be the bad guy. Did you not just hear me a few seconds ago? So your antagonist, especially if they are a person to rival the protagonist, like as in a baddie or a school rival or, you know, someone who wants to hunt the avatar. So if the antagonist is a person of some sorts, usually they will have a want and need just like the protagonist. And just like the protagonist, their wants and needs can be the same or different. And if you really want to have fun and screw around with your characters, I mean, have the best story out there because reasons and such I can't think of right now. You can have your protagonist and antagonist have the same want and need. And spoiler alert for Avatar The Last Airbender, if you have not seen this, Skip ahead! So, last time, spoiler alert, skip ahead or not, one, two, three, go! In Avatar The Last Airbender, you have Aang, the last airbender, who wants to just play around and all that, but learns that he needs to learn all four elements and all that, and you know, his wants and needs throughout the series changes, but the main need is he needs to find teachers in order to teach him all the other elements besides air, right? He goes to his friends for that. Too bad that he does not have a firebender friend because life sucks. But then there's Zuko who wants to hunt down the Avatar because he thinks he needs to restore his honor. But in reality, he needs to be the Avatar's firebender teacher. You have the wants, a little bit different. You know, you have one person who just wants to have fun and ignore the fact that there's war going on. That doesn't work out well. And then you have another person's wants to restore his honor, and that definitely doesn't work out well. But their needs are one and the same, even though they're somewhat different. They need to become allies and help each other 
in order to stop the war altogether. <sighs> and in all honesty, I'm pretty sure this is one of the reasons why Avatar The Last Airbender is seen as one of the best things that has ever happened to animation. The main point is, you will have the protagonist and antagonist go against each other. Now, Here's a good little twist on the antagonist slash protagonist wants and needs. If the antagonist is a thing, like, you know, a huge thunderstorm that's going to destroy everything because, oh my god, there's like 10 tornadoes in it and such, whatever, then it may not necessarily have a want, but it has a need. And and hear me out, hear me out. This, this will make total sense if you think like me, which I apologize for the headache. But hear me out. The need of a thunderstorm or any kind of storm at all is to take its course and then be done with it. Kind of like the, you know, a tsunami. Like something happens in the water, there's an earthquake or whatever, and it creates this disruption in the water. Well, that water that's been disrupted has to go somewhere. That's its need to make sure that disruption gets like just shoved away somewhere where there's no more disruption. Some people can say, well, well, that's not really a need. And I would argue, because I'm making the point in the first place. Now, will the antagonist always have a want? I don't know. Depends on who your antagonist is. If it's a storm system, maybe not. Unless it's a magical storm system. But we'll get to that. No, we won't. We will not. But this is just to keep your mind open about the possibilities out there. The seventh thing, or point... Whatever. Whatever we're calling. Clashes. Dun dun dun. Now, because the protagonist has wants and needs, and because the antagonist has wants and needs, or needs at least, uh, they will clash. They will go together. Because if you do not have clashes, you do not have conflict. If you do not have conflict, you probably have a really boring story or some existential crisis on your hands. Whatever. Don't make a boring story just because you don't want your protagonist and antagonist going up against each other. Do not make that Boring story. Don't. Just don't. But here's the thing. I'm about to make a twist. Your protagonist and antagonist don't necessarily have to meet up and have a clash. <gasps> what? And this is where my love of anime comes back in. Oh my goodness, y'all. If you only knew. The fact is, your good guy probably won't go up against the bad guy until the very end. So, yeah, he may have to go up against the bad guy henchmen, which, you know, could be many antagonists and all that, and they could have their own backstory and all of this stuff. You know, like I said, the antagonists, they, it could be, be different people and all that. But the main antagonist, your hero, won't get to until the very end. Whether that's the very end of the series, like in Harry Potter, or the very end of the book, depending if you're doing a one-shot or whatever. Now you might be asking, how many clashes should I have in my story? Well, if you're going to do a flash fiction, probably only one. Because flash fiction is very, very small. There's like a hundred words. Short stories, about the same. Probably one. As you get more and more into stuff like novellas and novels and, and just epics and all that and the entire Harry Potter series and, you know, other big time books, series that are huge, that go on for days and years and you just kind of give up because the newest one hasn't come out yet, but then, oh, suddenly it does, and then you're like, wait, I can't get it, because I just spent my money paying my phone bill. But the number will probably increase. If you have a huge novel, like 50,000 words, and you only have one clash? Really? Really? Like... Really? Probably doing it wrong. I'm not trying to tell you how to do your job. I'm just saying from experience and reading a lot of books and, and just everything. Is my word the end-all be-all? No. No, it's not. But you need to have more than one clash and your huge novel, if you're going to call it a novel, don't make a boring story. And as I said before, the main protagonist and the main antagonist might not fight each other at all or until the end of the story. So what does that mean? Your protagonist or the group or whatever will go up against different antagonists and all that, right? Yes. Yeah. This is why you need to write these down. You might have more than one of each, right? 
And that means you might have more than one clashes and all that. And to go along with this, to twist your little brains even more, to, 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 to mind blowing and all that, the type of clashes you will have is determined by who or what your protagonist is and who or what your antagonist is. If there's a giant storm system coming, five tornadoes all around, and that's your antagonist, you know, nature, and your protagonist is a little boy trying to save his entire town who seems to be, like, just brain dead to the fact that there's going to be a massive storm system hitting, and they're like, it's not gonna be that bad. And he's like, no, it is. I don't know how I know, I just know it is. There will be certain clashes, right? Uh, the boy might have to face the storm in order to save his little sister. Uh, the boy might get out of the way and then the storm come. And the clashes come from the people who ignore him. And the people who are like, wait, you were right on the long. Or whatever, you know, it, it just depends on the story you write. However, and this is a big however, if you're writing a romance... Do not put fight scenes and all that in it. Like, if it's if it's just a romance. It's, it's not like a supernatural romance. It's not like a thriller romance or anything like that. It's, it's just a romance. And that's okay. You can have just one genre. I do not want to see an epic battle between two entities that have fought for centuries. The clashes in a romance? Totally different from the clashes in a YA fantasy thriller that has no... Love triangles whatsoever. I'm still trying to find that. That's not going to happen. So in a romance, you have the protagonist and then the antagonist. And they're fighting it against each other to get the love interest to like them and not the other person. Well, this makes clashes like maybe the antagonist tries to come on to the love interest in a sexy way, which I don't know how to do that. Maybe the protagonist will try to get a dinner date before the antagonist does. Maybe the protagonist and antagonist find out the love interest is dating both of them at the same time, so they dump his butt. Or you can even have a romance where the antagonist isn't the love rival, but the love interest's sister. So she doesn't think the protagonist over here is a good enough fit for her brother and so she tries to make sure the protagonist can't do anything at all that could mean like canceling the date or you know whatever so, yeah. so yes genre does have a little bit to do with what will happen but the main thing is you have to think about your protagonist and antagonist who and what are they and how will that affect the clashes for example, and I know some of you are like, woo, or some of you are like, woo, with this example, but it's a really good one. So hold, hold, hold your peace until the end. In Harry Potter, the first book, Harry does not fight Voldemort head on. No, 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 no. Harry is a little boy. He does not fight the big baddie in the first book. However, because Voldemort exists in this world, and he, as the villain, is trying to become whole once again and take over the universe, you know, whatever he's doing. And Harry exists as the boy who lived. Because Harry is a wizard, and Voldemort is a wizard who is bad, they will clash together. So in all the books, even if Harry doesn't go up against Voldemort head on, but goes up against his henchmen who all have their different wants and needs, right? He will have to fight like a wizard. He will have to determine, hey, how do I defeat Voldemort? Hmm, let's think of this in wizard terms because they're wizards. It's the whole thing about the books. They're wizards. <laughs> so before you write down any clashes, figure out the other things I told you. Just saying, it, it kind of helps to go in order. Just a little bit. The eighth and last thing you have to think about is the outcome. Dun, dun, dun. And of course, there's a twist to this, like everything else in this video. With each and every clash that you had in the last section, there will be an outcome. Who wins or what wins? The protagonist or the antagonist? So if I was writing this all down, I'd, you know, write down my protagonist and his or her wants and needs and the antagonist and wants and needs and all of that loveliness and do each and every clash like clash. Protagonist versus blah. Outcome. Do-do-do-do-do. Outcome. 
do, 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 outcome. And just do it like that. But the main outcome that you really have to focus on is the overall outcome, the last bit. So like in the romance, will the protagonist defeat the evil sister? Actually, she's just overprotective. It's fine. And gain the love interest. Or like in Loading Life, will Hero overcome the evil villain? I can't tell you that because that would be a spoiler and I want you to buy the book to actually figure out. So please, go buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry. Subliminal messaging. Actually, that wasn't even subliminal. That was just on the top messaging. So at least I'm not being sneaky with you all. Or am I? So you have to think, in the end, will the protagonist or antagonist win? Will they both win? And how do you know they win? Because their want and or need is met. So you, as the writer, have to determine Who's going to win in the end? And of course, here's another pro tip, because I told you there'd be many. The protagonist doesn't have to win. They can lose. What? The good guy lose? Yeah, it, it's happened, even in anime. If the good guy loses, the protagonist, if they're a good guy or not, if they lose, what happens? What happens to the world? What happens to them? You know? Because see, you are creating this amazing story. And it's more than just a structure on the page. It's this whole entire world. Now, you may only have one novel or a few poems, but it's a world unto its own. So what's going to happen in that world? How is that world going to be affected if the protagonist loses or if they win? What if the antagonist loses or wins? What if they both win? What if they both lose? There's so many options. And it's so cool and it's so exciting. And I think that's why I love writing. Because it's exciting. Because you can create something that's yours. And it's, it's, it's amazing. It, so cool. So to review, you have to have a protagonist. You have to have an antagonist. Both the protagonist and antagonist has to have wants and needs, or at least a need, right? And because of those wants and needs of the protagonist and antagonist, you will have clashes, right? If you only have a flash fiction or a short story, it might just be one clash. But if you have something bigger than that, it has to be more than one clash, okay? And for every clash you have, which will hopefully reflect the genre you're working in, and who and what the protagonists and antagonists are, you have to list out the outcomes. How does each and every clash end? And what are the effects of it? What's the outcome? And with all of that said, I hope you all enjoyed this video. And if you want to know more about actual story structures and not just me blabbering on for a good long chunk of time. Definitely check out the rest of the Word Start crew. I will have the playlist down in the description and over to the side or wherever, you know, YouTube has this and all that. So yes. And you can see all the Word Sock episodes that I have participated in in a huge master list. And let me know in the comments if you found this entertaining and or educating or edutaining or whatever and all that. And if you have some like cool things you could add to it. Because hey, my word isn't the final word. I'm not the Lord Jesus Christ. I checked. I'm not. And with that, I'd like to give a big thank you to Flutter Sage. Thank you, Flutter Sage, for watching. And I'll see y'all later, alligators. Bye-bye. <laughs>